Hi, this is Valerie Leonard. Um, we will be going live on Facebook within about one minute. Just thought I would start the broadcast about a minute early here in Crowdcast. And um, give me just a moment. I will get our PowerPoint presentation. So we are now live. My name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia. I want to say thank you so much for joining us, and I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those of you who are here with me in Crowdcast. I want to welcome those who are watching from YouTube as well as Facebook. Now, if you are watching through Facebook and if you want to make comments that I can see, you will need to join us in Crowdcast, and I have included a link in the comment section on my Facebook page for you to click on so you can join us in Crowdcast. Um, if you prefer to stay out in Facebook Live, feel free to make comments and I will make sure that I get back to you just as soon as I can. And for those of you who are with us here in Crowdcast, I just want to say again, um, good morning and thank you for joining us. I'd like for you to indicate who you are, um, your name, where you're from, and if there's anything that you'd like to get out of this, please feel free to ask a question. You can ask a question either in the chat room or you can ask a question um, in the ask a question link at the bottom of the page. And without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, as you may or may not know, Nonprofit Utopia has been doing a series of webinars on the census. And this is the fourth of a four part series. When we started, we focused on why you as a nonprofit should care about the 2020 census. And we have archived that webinar here on um, our page here at Crowdcast. In our second week, we talked about the community of interest and why that's so important in the redistricting process. And today we're going to talk about the legal implications for redistricting. And last week, I'm sorry, um, we focused on a proposal that we put together as a community and when I say the community, I'm talking about a broad-based coalition that was headed by the uh, UCRO. Um, Josina Morita played a very important role in that. So we shared some of the strategies that we used um, last during the last redistricting, and we shared the proposal and some of the maps. So today we're going to talk about the legal implications. And I want to point your attention to the fact that we have a link to an archive um, file that we have for the Lawndale Alliance. There are a number of documents that you can download. You can look at some of the map proposals that were done. You can look at our testimony. You can look at notes from meetings. And there's no guarantee that the process is going to be the same as it was 10 years ago. But I think regardless, it's a learning um, tool for anyone who would be interested, um, good case study for community engagement. And here is a link to a news story on the 1980 lawsuit that, I'm sorry, 1982 lawsuit that stemmed from the Chicago remapping process. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about Nonprofit Utopia. We're the ideal community for emerging nonprofit leaders. We have created a safe environment in which you can discuss issues of concern regarding your nonprofit. Um, and you can also talk about other issues concerning your nonprofit, um, concerning the community, and reach out to others who might enlist, you might enlist in helping you. And you can also share ideas, create new programs if you so choose. Our mission is to develop the next generation of ethical nonprofit leaders, and we provide ongoing professional development and networking opportunities 
And our overarching goal is to give our members the tools that they need to develop strong organizations that will make a lasting impact. So this includes things like self-assessments to determine your leadership style, assessments where you can look at the strengths and weaknesses of your organizations. Uh, we also have tools, you know, discussions, you can post, you can read articles, you can look at funding sources, job postings. We have webinars like today's event. We have classes that you can download on demand and we have special events. So a little bit about me, I'm a consultant and I specialize in community and organizational development. In case you missed it, my name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia and I also host the Nonprofit Utopia broadcast podcast on Blog Talk Radio. That's an extension of our community. You get a chance to hear lessons learned from people who have been there, done that, some of the thought leaders across the country in nonprofit. And I also teach online courses in nonprofit management at UIC and face-to-face -face courses in business in terms of social enterprise at Roosevelt University. I have a master of management for in finance and marketing, and I have an undergrad degree in economics from Spelman College. And we've got a lot to cover, very little time in which to do it, but basically we want to share a case study of some of the work that we've done in North Lawndale with a group of organizations from around the city, around the state of Illinois, to um, put together a community-driven proposal for redistricting. So we will talk about this for about a half hour or so. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions and participate in live chat. For those of you who are participating on Facebook Live, I won't be able to see your comments, but I promise you, if you leave your comments, I will come out and respond to them just as soon as I can. If you want to join us, you can do so. Um, there is a link to this podcast on my Facebook page, and you can join us here in Crowdcast, and that way I can see your questions and comments. And you'll have a link to resources to help you understand the census and the redistricting process. Again, I want to point your attention to a link to archive files that we have from the Lawndale Alliance. We have those in the chat room. And then when this uh, webinar is done, you'll get a recording that you can refer to from time to time. So here is the actual presentation that we did back in May of 2011. At this point, the re um, the census was taken in 2010, and the um, census department had just gone through their first pass of data, and they had been in contact with the states to give them a sense for what reapportionment could look like. And we, at the community level, were positioning ourselves to advocate to make sure that our communities were kept in con intact and to make sure that um, our voices were heard in any redistricting proposal. So at that point, we acknowledged a lot of people. We had State Representative Art Turner Jr., State Representative LaShawn Ford, and the late Commissioner Robert Steele, who were very, very helpful in putting together a boot camp. There was a three-part uh, redistricting boot camp that we did in North Lawndale for people who wanted to better understand the process and then who wanted to put input into a redistricting proposal that was driven by the community. We also thank Tony Pitchford, Nicole Miller, and Steve Lau of the U.S. Census Bureau. They gave us significant technical assistance, helping us to navigate census.gov, helping us understand different terminology, helping us to understand how the census relates to redistricting and <clears throat> how to map, um, how to do different maps. So we thank them and we thank um, Tudor Mentor Connection for allowing us to use their maps. We had a number of partners working with us. We obviously were the Lawndale Alliance. 
We had ICAR, we had IVI, IPO, the Open Door Foundation, Empowered Citizens of North Lawndale, the United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations, or UCRO, and the North Lawndale Community News. Our planning committee included activist Richard Barnett, Melva Brownlee, um, David Evers. I have a typo here. I have Michael, but it was David Evers. He, Melva and David were representing Commissioner Steele's office. We had the late Millie Goldsmith, Bruce Jackson, Mickey Johnson, Jimmy Lee Lard, myself, Isaac Lewis, who is the publisher of the North Lawndale Community News. We had Mr. Fred Mitchell, who is the head of Econo. We had Janae Moreno representing Representative Arthur Turner's office. We had Josina Marita, who at that time was working with UCRO, and um, she played an instrumental role in doing the maps, a statewide map that pulled um, communities together from all over the state, minority communities, Asian community, the Latino community, Black community. And if we uh, worked with her to advance a statewide proposal that would maximize opportunities for minorities to be represented fairly in the redistricting process and in our voting processes. We had Aviva Pat from IVI IPO and she was very instrumental in sharing real life experiences with redistricting. We had Sandra Spellman, Dwayne Truss from um, Austin community. We had Jeffrey Turner from Lawndale, Jocelyn Woodard from ICAR and Ms. Gladys Woodson from the Lawndale community. So we always started our meetings with prayer and scripture, and we engaged a member of the audience to do that for us. Then we had a presentation on the what, the why, the when, the who, and the how from Jimmy Lee Lard, a community resident, and he was also a member of the Lawndale Alliance. I talked about the legal considerations, and no, I'm not an attorney. I was just sharing um, publicly available information and then we had a presentation of case studies from Aviva Pat with IVI IPO, sharing some of her lived experiences with redistricting here in Chicago. So this first section was delivered by Jimmy Lee Lard. He talked about the what, the why, the when, the who, and the how. So what is redistricting? So redistricting is the process of you know, redrawing existing political boundaries. So every 10 years, the census is taken and then those data are used to draw the boundaries for our representative districts at the federal level, state level, county level, city level. And some people might have districts for their school boards. And then um, for the state of Illinois, our constitution gives the General Assembly the responsibility for redrawing legislative boundaries every 10 years. And I would imagine that that's the same um, across the country. And apportionment is the process of dividing our 435 districts or our seats in the House of Representatives among the 50 states. And this is done based on the outcome of the census. So based on the population figures that are collected every 10 years, there are 435 seats and the, they are spread out proportionately to each state's population. So the more population you have in your state, the more representatives you have in Congress. And the state of Illinois has 19 representatives and you know at that point, and we were poised to lose a, a representative and we're um, getting ready to lose yet another one. So um, after the 2000 census, we had 19 representatives. And at uh, after 2010, we dropped down to 18 and we're looking to go down to 17. 
So even though our state population had grown 3%, we still were not growing at a fast enough rate to maintain that extra seat. So we lost a seat. So on the state level, most states maintain a fixed number of legislators, but some states actually have the number of legislators to vary with the size of their population. So if they lose significant population, they may lose a seat. And if they gain significant population, they may add a seat. But in Illinois, we keep everything constant and we have 118 seats in our House of Representatives and 15 senators. And the way this is structured, we have one senator for every two legislative districts. And we have what you call a nested district, meaning for every senatorial district has within it the boundaries of two legislative districts. So for me, I am in the fifth senatorial district and the fifth senatorial district is made up of district nine legislative district and District 10 Legislative District. And at that time, District 9 was represented by Arthur Turner Jr. and he still is state representative there. So reapportionment in summary is the process every 10 years of deciding based on population, how many representatives the state will receive. And this, again, it happens at the state and local levels. And when we did our map, we focused on the state. Uh, and at that time, you know, there was a, a growing pressure to have sunlight or sunshine on the redistricting process. And there was more pressure, much more pressure at the state level than at the local level. The local redistricting processes were not nearly as transparent as what occurred at the state level. At the state level, we had a governor, Pat Quinn, who was a populist to the core. And he um, was, was very um, supportive of making sure that there was community input. There were community groups who wanted to make sure that there was community input as well as transparency in the state redistricting process. There was a thrust by some to have a machine to actually draw the lines. And then there was also talk of having an independent commission to draw those lines. And we're seeing similar, um, similar talk right about now, but we're focusing more on the count at this point. You know, I will admit it's a little premature to talk about redistricting because redistricting can't happen until after the census is done. But I felt that it was important to start start the conversation because when we got involved last time, I felt like even though we were able to attend most of the hearings, that we were behind the eight ball. So I'm sharing lessons learned so community groups can start you know, mobilizing. You know, As soon as we get the census counts, they will also have a better understanding of what kinds of strategies they can use in order to advocate for a fair redistricting process at the state and local levels. And during one of our previous sessions, um, we got a question from Ramona Taylor Williams, who is from Jackson, Mississippi. She um, indicated that um, she was very, very interested in um, in the prison count. You know, making sure prisoners are um, counted properly and adequately. You know, because in some states that prisoners lose, you know, they're disenfranchised totally. That you know, once you're convicted, you never get the right to to vote again in some states. And um, her question to me was, please highlight the connection between an accurate and complete count, redistricting, and voting rights. And we'll be covering a lot of that. Um, if not here, you can go back and look at some of our prior webinars. And um, her question was, why is it essential to reach those hard to count areas? And again, she was very supportive of making sure that prisoners were counted 
and making sure that they are counted in the um, communities from where they originate. So um, we talked in prior webinars about why it's so important to have an accurate and complete count. You know, when we look at the resources that are available, we're talking about 900 billion, that's billion with the B dollars that are available up for grabs. And if you don't have an accurate count, you know, if you're, if you're undercounting, then chances are you're going to be missing out on some money. Um, we, we shared, you know, the relationship between the undercount and how much money you can actually lose. I, I think in the state of Illinois, for every person that was undercounted, um, you know, that was excluded, we could lose about $1,500. And that adds up pretty quickly. It, it came out to billions of dollars. And I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but if you listen to our very first webinar um, explaining why it's important for nonprofits and communities and churches to be counted, then you'll get you know more specific figures in that webinar. And it's important too, if you live in an urban area where you have a high concentration of ex-offenders, high concentration of immigrants, high concentration of seniors who are typically shut in, um, if you have a transient population, um, those people tend to be hard to reach, hard to count for a number of reasons. One could be they're um, transient. Two, they may not trust the government. So it's really important for you to get involved with working with your elected officials as well as community groups on these complete count committees. And if you listen to our previous webinars, there is a link to those sites where you can register and get more, more information. The issue about prisoners being counted in the census is very critical because um, states have discretion as to how they're going to count the, how are they going to count the prisoners. In the state of Illinois, we count them in, you know, if they're in prison the day of the census, which is April 1st, then they are counted in that prison town. Now, typically, you know, prisoners don't stay in those jails for, for 10 years. They return to their communities of origin and those communities like mine, North Lawndale, that have a high number of returning citizens, we have a number of social service programs. However, we could have a whole lot more resources if they are counted from, you know, from um, the Lawndale community in the census, as opposed to, you know, Vandalia. And what happens is you really have a, a misallocation of resources and people. So, and you also have an undercount. So if you, we have prisoners who are downstate, we are, you know, at the time of the census, they're counted in the downstate numbers and we are, you know, up north in Chicago, and particularly in those areas where many of the prisoners originate, we have an undercount of population, whereas that prison town has an overcount. And not only do they have an overcount, they have disproportionately more money that goes along with those people um, who are in prison. And we are responsible for taking care of them, you know, uh, ex-prisoners once they return to our communities. However, we don't have the, uh, the resources that would go along with them. The resources are staying down state. So it's really, really, really important to make sure one, that you are counted, two, that you are vigilant with the redistricting process you know, because we want to make sure that everybody is represented fairly and we want to make sure our communities get the resources that we deserve. So who draws the lines? Um, in Illinois, the state legislature draws the lines and if a plan may be drawn and approved by June 30th. So 
So basically the state legislature general assembly has until June 30th to agree to a plan. And if they don't have an agreement, then the map is drawn by an independent commission. And we were very fortunate that they came to an agreement, you know, by um, May 27th or something like that. So it didn't have to go before a commission. So here is the redistricting timeline. So it starts off when, um, for us, in December 2010, it started off with, with the fact that the state populations and congressional apportionment numbers, those were delivered to President Obama. And as a result of the last census, we lost one of our 19 congressional districts. In January 12th, that was when our General Assembly started their session. And by June 30th, you know, they were hoping to have a redistricting plan in place. And that would include a map of, uh, of the uh, Congress. They would have the congressional maps as well as the state maps at the Senate and um, representative level. And if they didn't have a plan in place, then they were going to have to spend from June 30th to October going through a process of selecting an independent commission, making sure that the commission was evenly divided between Republicans and Democrats, and making sure that commission developed a proposal that was um, voted upon by five of the eight people. And if there was a tie, then they would have to get someone to come and break a tie. Um, and then they would then have to come together and draw that again, you know, make sure that they come to an agreement. So luckily we didn't have to go through that process and our map was done by June 30th as opposed to October 5th. So why does redistricting matter? Um, it matters to everybody. Um, however, most of us are not focused on it because it's not necessarily a transparent process. So we don't really think about how important it is. As I indicated before, you know, there's a lot of for grabs. Political power is up for grabs. Resources that come back to your community is up to grab. Uh, representation, you know, and your voice as an individual matters. But the politicians, when they look at the redistricting, you know, they see ways that they can preserve their power. So some of the criticism is the current redistricting process, as it's typically practiced, is it allows politicians to choose their voters rather than the voters choosing their politicians or their elected officials. The redistricting process can be used to eliminate incumbents or consolidate their power. So depending on you know whether or not the incumbent is in favor with the party um, can depend on whether or not they're trying to preserve the incumbent's power or if they're trying to cut the incumbent's power off. They can be used to eliminate Challengers. So, for example, after Barack Obama won 30% of the vote against Congressman Bobby Rush, that district, you know, Congressman Bobby Rush's district was redrawn to eliminate Barack Obama's house. So, Barack Obama was the only person in that geographic area who did not, who was not in. Congressman Rush's district. He was in the neighboring district, so he would not pose a threat. And why should you care about redistricting? Especially, you know, if you are part of a minority group, um, minority meaning uh, a racial minority, uh, minority along culture, cultural lines, political lines. Um, you should be really concerned because, you know, the redistricting tactics, you know, can be used to pack partisans. So you can draw districts in such a way as to get as many people as possible in the district who are most likely to vote a certain way. So 
again, that could be, you know, people tend to think of minority groups being monolithic in their vote. And that that's not always the case, but it is often the case. So in some instances to keep um, black people from exercising the political power to them, there, there are instances where um, minority groups or blacks or Latinos were packed in a group so they couldn't have as many districts as they were due. In the state of Illinois, um, people typically are more conservative leaning in their views, um, but the way the maps are drawn, um, they are drawn to favor Democrats as opposed to uh, Republicans. And the redistricting process often takes into account political considerations more so than any other consideration. And they don't necessarily care about um, neighborhood boundaries. They care more about the political boundaries. And sometimes these maps can be drawn intentionally, not, not always, but sometimes intentionally to dilute the minority vote. So how are the lines drawn? Literally, how are they drawn? You know, there are a number of ways you can start the process. You can start, I mean, you obviously have to look at what you have already. You know, what is already in place? Um, some people start by drawing around the minority communities to make sure that they're in compliance with the Voting Rights Acts. Um, you, some people can start at the northeast corner of of the state, some, and work their way to the southwest. Some might start at the southeast corner and work their way to the northwest. And then others may start at the center and branch outward. But I think it's always prudent, you know, to make sure that you're in compliance with the Voting Rights Act to start and uh, start with the map and know where your minority groups are and make sure that the lines are drawn in such a way that they can maximize their opportunities. And at the time, um, at the state level, we were very focused on transparency, you know, allowing the public to understand not only the process and provide input into redistricting, but understand how and why those lines were drawn as they were. So after that, I talked about legal considerations. I want to remind everybody that I'm not an attorney. I was just sharing information that is publicly available. So we talked about the 14th Amendment and we looked at the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And that is a provision that includes equal protection under the law and basically as it relates to voting, you want to make sure that for every person, you know, one one person, one vote. We also looked at the 15th Amendment, and that talked about um, the fact that it was unlawful to deny a citizen to um, vote based on the citizen's race, color, or previous condition of servitude, for example, whether or not they were formerly a slave. And that was ratified on February 3rd, my dad's birthday, 1870. And no, he wasn't around in 1870, rest his soul. Then we talked about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and how that was based on the 15th Amendment and what that does is prohibit states from imposing any voting qualification or prerequisite to voting or any standard or practice or procedure that would deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color. So we've all heard of Jim Crow, we've all heard of poll taxes, poll tests, where you know, people would be asked to pay money um, in order to vote money that they probably couldn't afford to pay, um, take tests where there were answers that were just impossible to find, like how many 
bubbles in a bar of soap and all that good stuff. And if they could answer those questions, then they could vote. So the Voting Rights Act of 1965 did away with that. And you can see in modern times, um, even though the Voting Rights Act is still in force, you know, politicians will be politicians. They're still figuring out ways to disenfranchise votes through, you know, um, discouraging people at the polls, you know, making it very difficult through voter ID laws, um, limiting the number of voter stations so that there are long lines and, you know, other things that um, help them to discourage people. Um, another uh, Purging the voting rolls is another way to discourage people. And that happens, it happens all over the country, but um, these tactics tend to be more prevalent in the South. So um, they were really, really focusing on the South when they um, did the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So Congress intended the, the act to outlaw the practice of requiring otherwise qualified voters to pass literacy in order to register to vote, which was a principal means by which Southern states had prevented African Americans from exercising the franchise. It also established extensive federal oversight of elections administration, providing that states with a history of discriminatory voting practices, so-called covered jurisdictions, would not implement any change affecting voting without first obtaining the approval of the Department of Justice, a process of preclearance. The act has been renewed and amended by Congress four times, and the most recent being a 25-year extension signed into law by President George W. Bush in 2006. And I would imagine, and I don't really have to imagine, in this current climate, we need to be more vigilant than ever, you know, because the Voting Rights Act of 1965 has been under assault ever since it was passed. We also have the Illinois Voting Rights Act of 2011. And this provides that the legislative districts or and representative districts must be drawn to create majority minority districts, crossover districts, coalition districts, or influence districts. It provides definitions for the new districts and the voting rights of Illinois can't override any provision of the US constitution or our state constitution. So if there are any two clauses that conflict at the state level and the voting rights of Illinois level, then our state would override that. If there's any conflict between um, the Illinois Voting Rights Act of 2011 and the Illinois Constitution, the Illinois Constitution clauses would, uh, would be stronger. So any violations of the act will lead to the creation of a new redistricting plan that would correct the violation. And the Illinois Voting Rights Act of 2011 also created the Redistricting Transparency and Public Participation Act. And all of this, again, was under Governor Quinn. And when we look at the three districts that are defined by the Illinois Voting Rights Act of 2011, we see a coalition district. Now, coalition district is a district where more than one group of racial minorities or language minorities, they form a co coalition to elect the candidate of the coalition's choice. We have the crossover district where you have a racial minority teaming up with white people to elect the candidate of choice um, that, you know, the minority group can stomach, so to speak. And then we have the influence district in which the racial minority doesn't have enough people to elect the candidate of their choice, but they vote as a block and they can really swing an election one way or another. 
And when we look at the Illinois Redistricting Transparency and Public Participation Act, we find that the Senate and House of Representatives must each establish a committee. So each one of them had a redistricting committee. There was a Senate redistricting committee that was headed by uh, former Senator Kwame Raoul. He's now our Attorney General. And then there was a House redistricting committee. Um, I believe it was headed by Representative Barbara Flynn Curry, former representative. And if I'm incorrect, please let me know. But I, that's my 10 year recollection. And they would form these committees every year. And they also had an option of joining, of creating a joint committee that was comprised of the committees of two. And from time to time, they would meet as a joint committee and have public hearings. But each committee was responsible for hosting at least four public meetings around the state where they would get input from the public. Um, you could be a rank and file resident, you could be an elected official, anyone who had a voice or a um, proposal, they were heard during these hearings. Every hearing was open to the public and the chairperson of each committee or the co-chairpersons of a joint committee as applicable had to provide a minimum of six days notice before any proposed hearing with the secretary of the Senate, clerk of the house or both. So it was a pretty intensive process. I, I thought it went very well. So the guidelines to drawing district boundaries in Illinois, the districts must be compact when practical, meaning you wanna get as many people in an area, you know, you, you look at the um, entire boundary and you want to create um, areas that are, that have relatively equal populations, but you wanna make sure that rather than have the area be spread out, you want it to be compact when practical. And so, so meaning ideally you don't want gerrymandering, but you'll see that, that that's not always possible. And districts must have an equal population. Districts must be contiguous, which means that they, all the land has to be, you know, every part of it has to touch some other part. You can't have a gap between the, the districts and we'll share some examples. And then the districts must not be drawn in a way that violates state and federal voting rights laws. That's why I think it's practical to start with the minority population first, see where they are, and then build your districts around them. So Aviva Pat from IVI IPO, she shared with us some case or a case study of what happened in 1980. Um, she talked about the project, the players, the objectives, the map, and the suit. She did not prepare um, slides, so I don't have them in this presentation, but I did want to read to you an article that would give you some flavor, some indication of why it's extremely, extremely important to participate in the census, why it's extremely important to be vigilant of the redistricting process. So this is an article that was from the Chicago Tribune. I believe it might have come out in 1984. I, I don't have the date here, but it's called the Remap of Wards Upheld. And that was by Philip Lentz with the Chicago Tribune. So it says, um, the US Supreme Court Monday refused to hear an appeal in the Chicago City Council remap case, sending the potentially explosive issue back to the lower courts to redraw boundaries and set new elections in some wards. The Supreme Court let stand a ruling by the US Court of Appeals here that the current ward map unfairly dilutes the voting strength of blacks and Hispanics. The ruling made without comment was a victory for Mayor Harold Washington, who opposed the appeal and hopes to win control of the now divided city council under new ward lines. This is great news, said Alderman Timothy Evans of the fourth ward 
He's the mayor's chief political spokesman. The court has now ruled it's time for the citizens of those wards to be represented by people of their own choice. Alderman Edward Vordoliak of the 10th Ward, leader of the council's anti-Washington majority faction that brought the appeal, called the ruling another step along the way. He said it, he would wait for his lawyers to read the opinion before commenting in more detail. The case now returns to the U.S. District Court here with instructions to come up with new boundaries for a handful of wards on the northwest and southwest sides. The appeals court has recommended that the new map include, quote unquote, super majorities of blacks and Hispanics in certain wards to ensure that they win control of those wards. The court said the solution would remedy discrimination against minorities, it said, occurred when the original map was drawn in 1981. A lawsuit filed by minorities alleged that the council adjusted ward boundaries so black voters on the edges of predominantly black parts of the city would be split off and placed in white majority wards where they would constitute a large but ineffectual minority. It also charged that Hispanic voters were spread over several wards to dilute their potential voting strength. The mayor's allies say they hope new elections would be held as early as this fall, but any election could be delayed if, as expected, the council majority appeals the map eventually approved by the district court. Verdoliak hinted at this strategy, saying that the case will not be resolved until the Supreme Court decides a North Carolina reapportionment case that deals with many of the same issues at stake in the Chicago case. I can't see any type of election in the fall, Verdoliak said, adding that it was possible, but highly unlikely, that a new map would be in place for the 1987 aldermanic elections. Evans, in turn, charged that the mayor's foes still will seek to use courts to delay a special election. I suspect the opponents will want to drag it out, Evans said. It has been suggested that they intend to appeal whatever map the district court makes to keep the process in the courts. Most of the wards in dispute are now represented by white aldermen allied with the anti-Washington bloc. Under a new map, Many of these aldermen would be vulnerable to black and Hispanic challengers, and their defeat could tip control of the city council to the mayor. Verdoliak forces control the council 29 to 21, so a loss of four seats could effectively make Washington's faction the majority. The mayor has the power to break tie votes. Judson Minor, an attorney representing the Blacks and Hispanics who challenged the current map, said a special election would be held in only five of the six wards where boundaries could be extensively changed. The wards affected would depend on what the map looks like. Among the wards that could be involved are the 7th, 15th, 22nd, 25th, 30th, 31st, 32nd, 35th, 37th, and possibly the first and 12th. Where there are only minor boundary changes, there would not be new elections. The original map drawn to reflect changes in the city's population in the 1980 census was thrown out in December 1982 when the U.S. Judge Thomas McMillan ordered the number of black majority wards to be increased from 19 to 17, I'm sorry, to 19 from 17 and Hispanic majority wards boosted to four from two to up to four from two. That new map was used in the 1983 elections and is in place today. But the minorities appealed the new map and the appeals court said McMillan had not gone far enough to correct the discrimination in the original 1981 map. It ordered a new map drawn with supermajorities used as guidelines for determining minority populations within wards. The council majority then appealed this decision to the Supreme Court. The U.S. Justice Department last month recommended that the court could not hear the case, although it disagreed that any new map should incorporate supermajorities. So now you understand why it's extremely, extremely important to be counted 
and why it's extremely important to be vigilant during the redistricting map and during the redistricting process. We want to make sure that everybody is fairly represented and each community has um, the resources that it needs. So now we want to talk about examples of gerrymandering. But before we do that, we wanted to get into what gerrymandering is. So this definition is from Wikipedia. Um, they're saying that gerrymandering is actually a corrupt political process, although it's legal. And what it does is it attempts to create a political advantage for a particular party or group by manipulating geographic boundaries to create partisan, incumbent, protected, and neutral districts. It's used to achieve desired electoral results for a particular party, or it might be used to help or hinder a, a particular group of constituents, such as a political group, a racial group, a linguistic group, a religious or class group. Gerrymandering may be used for positive or negative purposes. So the negative use, for example, is to give a party or a group of constituents disproportionate power to their numbers, disproportionately more. And for and a negative group, you know, people who are marginalized. A negative, a positive use is in the case of preserving voting rights, sometimes you have to draw strange shaped wards or boundaries in order to achieve um, proper representation. So the history of gerrymandering, it started back in 1812. Um, this is a cartoon that was drawn in 1812 and I got this from Wikipedia. So it says, first printed in March 1812, this political cartoon was drawn in reaction to the state Senate electoral districts drawn by Massachusetts legislature to favor the Democratic Republican Party candidate of Governor Elbridge Gerry over the Federalists. The caricature satirizes the bizarre shape of a district in Essex County, Massachusetts as a dragon. Federalist newspaper editors and others at the time likened the district shape to a salamander. So we get the term gerrymander from the combination of the word salamander and Governor Jerry's last name. So two aims of gerrymandering are to maximize the effects of supporters' votes and to minimize the effects of your opponent's votes. And I think we're masters or we have some masters of that art here in the state of Illinois. So packing concentrates as many voters of one type into an area so that you can reduce their influence in other areas and cracking spreads them out so that they never have a sufficiently large enough vote to actually make a difference in the district in which they live. And that you know, goes against the one man, one, one vote rule. So here is an example, and I got this from Wikipedia. This is from the ABCs of gerrymandering. And just imagine these are three examples Imagine these are maps. Imagine these are groups of people. So you got the orange group and you got the blue group. The orange group is in the minority. And so, uh, and the blue group is in the majority. So this represents a state with three equally sized districts, 15 voters and two parties. Okay, so in in the first example, A, we have, you know, equal districts, right? So in each district, we have two oranges and one plum. So in the first one, we have two, the oranges lose by a margin of three to two. In the second district, three to two, they lose and in, or in the minority, and then the third. Um, they are in the minority by a margin of three to two. 
or two to three. In this, and, and, and ideally this is what you want, this is what you think will happen based on where people live, based on their numbers, but that doesn't always happen. So the second example, this happens a lot in city areas versus suburban areas, city areas or upstate versus, um, versus downstate or rural versus city. So in the second area, in the second example in B, the orange wins the urban district. We'll assume that this is the inner city, this area here. Um, they have, they've won it by a margin of three to two, but they have lost in the outer district by a margin of three to two here and a margin of um, three to one in, in the southern region. And then in this third version, we have a gerrymandering technique that ensures a two to one win, right, for a minority party, right? So the, the reds or the oranges are in minority, but they got two districts the way these are drawn. So in this first district, they have a majority of three to two. In the second district, they have a majority of three to two. And then there's nobody here in this third district. So this is how conceivably a group that's in the minority can control the majority. And a good example of how that works is here in the state of Illinois. Most people in the state of Illinois tend to uh, be conservative and they may uh, be Republican, right? But if you look at our map, the way it's drawn, you have Democrats who are disproportionately represented based on what the expectation would be. Um, so, so I would liken this to Illinois um, you might expect it to be based on the way people vote Democrat versus um, Republican to look something like this, but it actually looks more like this. All right, so it's really, really important to understand the rules for drawing maps, and this is perfectly legal. It might not uh, feel good to people who lose. You know, when the Democrats are in power, they do this. When the Republicans are in power, they do it. And on a national basis, um, this is happening um, in favor of Republicans. Here in Illinois, we have a Democratic Party who has mastered this art to make sure that it works for them. So here are some examples of what those maps could look like. So this is District 4. This is a Latino district. Um, Notice this is contiguous. You know, everything in the C green is the Latino district four. So the boundaries are contiguous, it's not broken up. And it actually surrounds an African American district. So this area here, this is Congressman Manny Davis's district, and this is primarily African American out here at the time. This was uh, Representative Guterres' district and is now being represented by um, Representative Jesus Garcia. And interesting story, uh, Jesus Garcia was an alderman at the time, you know, back in 1984 when that lawsuit took effect and he was the first Latino alderman in his district. In fact, he was my alderman and he was a staunch staunch um, supporter of, of Harold Washington. And here is Congressional District 15. You know, just wanna give you a sense for how that's drawn. And you can imagine that the people downstate may have very different views, you know, culturally, um, their values and, and priorities versus the people who are in this more metropolitan um, Champaign-Urbana area. But yet they're in the same district. 
And the same thing is happening here on the Western section. So I just want to share with you those real examples of gerrymandering. And Cook County here is a case. Now look at District 17. So you got uh, a district here going from Northern Cook to Southern Cook. And culturally, I can imagine those are somewhat different. You know, they would definitely have different concerns, but yet they're represented by one person, you know, a single commissioner who has to be responsive to all of their needs. And then look at what's going on in District 6, you know, wrapping its way around District 5. So there's a some significant gerrymandering going on in Cook County as well as at the state level. And this is the ward map. Um, this is, um, you know, before the 2010 redistricting. And one, you know, one interesting shape is 27, the 27th ward on Chicago's west side, but it also has some of the near north side, some of the downtown area has um, Latino and African American populations on the west end and, and, and then on the east end, you know, more, um, more downtown, more uh, white. And, and at that point is very rapidly gentrifying. So that was the conclusion of that, of that presentation. I don't know if you have any any questions yourselves, and if you do, please feel free to post them here. And um, you know, if you're here with us in Crowdcast, feel free to post them in our chat room. If you're watching from Facebook or if you're watching from YouTube, be sure to post your questions and comments on the Facebook page and on the YouTube page, and I will get back to you just as soon as possible. So again, thank you so much. Um, if this will uh, conclude our webinar and I don't see any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar, I'm going to post it and you can download it um, at any point. It will be on our Crowdcast page. So Nonprofit Utopia has a Crowdcast page. You can download it. And for those of you who are listening on Facebook Live, the link to this is crowdcast.io forward slash lowercase e forward slash understanding hyphen the hyphen legal. So again, download it, share it with your friends. If you have any questions, you know how to contact me. I am at Valerie F. Leonard at nonprofitutopia.com. Take care. Bye-bye.